So 69 beautiful degrees at the ballpark. Cherry Blossom's in full bloom. It's baseball and that warms our hearts. Yeah, the Nets are number one. Best record in the league. That's been sewn up. Around baseball, some things to be decided today. It'll be fun to sit here in our perch and watch some of those things unfold. Let's do this. 162, game on. It's in the bullpen. The Nationals win. Looks deep enough. They win a thriller, a classic. Enjoy the ride, folks. It's a no-hitter for Jordan Zimmerman! The Nationals have walked off again. How can this keep happening? Goosebumps again. All the youngsters in the crowd tonight, they're happy. They finally have a baseball team they can cheer for in Washington, D.C. RFK Stadium was out of our life. First, it was, it, it was an every day. It was a daily part of my life and so many, so many uh, thousands of others. And then, poof, the magic dragon, all of a sudden, things changed. Ladies and gentlemen, here's the moment we've all been waiting for. We've been waiting 34 years for this. Let's meet your 2005 Washington Nationals. For 33 summers, RFK Stadium sat vacant for baseball. It was a reminder of baseball's sudden departure from the city, but perhaps a beacon for its potential return. When you haven't had something for going on 30 years and, and you know, going past 30 years, you, you assume that, it, well, it's, it's just not coming back. But the fact that the district never tore down RFK Stadium. This was something that a lot of other cities didn't have in terms of a, a suitable place to play if a Major League Baseball team ever did want to come back. On April 14, 2005, Major League Baseball returned to Washington at RFK Stadium. There was a baseball energy within a real game, and it wasn't an exhibition or a Cracker Jack old-timers game. The city that started the tradition of presidential first pitches reclaimed that honor. Fans turned out to see their new team and those who helped usher baseball back to the Capitol came to see what they helped to create. When we uh, came to RFK that night and they wanted to introduce some of the people involved in bringing baseball, I, I had a little bit of trepidation because I know that politicians are routinely booed, right? This is just a matter of course, and I had been booed many times in all different venues, all different sports. But lo and behold, they introduced me. I got a standing ovation. And I'll never forget that. But it was a great moment. I felt like, you know, one of the baseball greats, you know, waving to the crowd. It was just a great feeling to see all those fans there. Unlike anything I've ever seen before or since, these were folks who never adapted to becoming Orioles fans. It almost turned off to baseball altogether. Their team left in 71 and went to Texas, and they hadn't forgiven anybody. So for it to become a reality, the ante anticipation of that first game, the place was packed, and the, the atmosphere was unlike anything I've ever experienced. Washington, first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League. That was the slogan used to describe Washington's beloved senators in the 1950s and 60s, a team that averaged 90 losses a season and managed just one winning season from 1961 through 1971. But what is baseball without the losers? Without the Cubs fans who haven't celebrated a World Series winner in more than a century, or a Red Sox nation that rooted under the curse of the Bambino for nearly 100 years. For losing franchises and their fans, baseball is as much about the hope of the future 
as it is about the pain of the present. And for the fans in the nation's capital, it was no different. You're one of a gang of people. You are one of thousands. And, and you're stomping your feet. You're applauding. You're screaming. And all in like one group of people. You're excited. You're enthused. The only problem was you lost. How bad were the Washington Senators? Well, um, people remember the boys of summer, the Brooklyn Dodgers, who were very, very good. The Nats were the other boys of summer. They, they were losing as many games as the Dodgers were, were winning. They were a chronic last place team throughout the 1950s and most of the 60s. But if you were into baseball, it, it didn't matter so much that they were bad uh, because it was your team. So you would have, you'd find a way to root for them. But to root for a team, you have to have a team. And Washington twice found itself without one. A week before the 1971 season ended, American League owners approved the franchise move to Arlington, Texas to become the Texas Rangers. The announcement, while upsetting, was not unprecedented. A decade earlier, the league approved the Senators move to Minnesota and promised an expansion team in return. It was exchanging one bad team for another. When they left the first time, of course, they came right back and we got another team. When he left the second time, I wasn't worried. I knew we'd get another team just like we did the first time. Wrong. 33 years. People for at least 10 years thought a team would be coming back any day, including the next year in 72, again in 73. And the dawning understanding that a team was not coming back was a sadness on top of having lost a second team. So it was really depressing. It, it was so depressing uh, that within just two or three years, every baseball writer in town left town. It was certainly a big loss. Uh, it took a while for everybody to get over it, but you know, the product in Baltimore at that time was you know, a superior product in baseball. It was, uh, it, for baseball fans, it was an easy move to follow Frank and Brooks and, and, and the great teams of, of the Orioles. So, you know, for, for all of us who loved the, the game, it was, it was not like having your own team, but we, start, you know, we all rooted for the Orioles for 33 years. You kind of got it out of your head because it wasn't part of your life anymore. Many, thousands, in fact, of the Senators fans went over to the Orioles. There was no place else they could go. They're not going to go to Philadelphia or New York. So the Orioles, Baltimore, even though they were the bitter enemies of the Washington team, it, uh, it, there, there was just nothing else you could do. I mean, it was a, a sad, sad time. On September 29th, 2004, nearly 33 years to the day since they left, baseball is back in Washington, D.C. There were some hints and signals that this, that this was going to be positive for the district, but I was still kind of like, you know, I'll believe it when I see it, you know, and I still was very, very concerned. I still was very, very nervous. And so when I finally got that call, uh, it's unforgettable to be able to go out and say we actually had a team. Even those who campaigned for baseball's return to D.C. began to doubt if it would ever happen, and with good reason. There had been plenty of false hopes throughout the years. Many teams threatened to move to Washington, but they never showed up. And when Major League Baseball decided to add four more teams in the 1990s, it chose cities in Florida, Colorado, and Arizona. Washington had the unshakable reputation of a losing baseball town that could not support a team. You couldn't escape the fact that we'd lost two teams. It was by the 80s that the town had begun to grow, the demographic had changed, it was a more prosperous, uh, more educated, it was really the baseball demographic. But it was stunning to see baseball ignore Washington for at least 15 and maybe 20 years more than they should have. There's been so many false rumors over the years, you know, the San Diego Padres at one point, the Giants, uh, others I think along the way, but um, it seemed like you know, there, there was no way for Montreal to hold on to the team. 
and we were certainly hoping that uh, DC would get it. They had other options, but it seemed like the nation's capital was a logical choice. But even the most logical of thoughts can leave room for doubt. I think those of us who had been in the sports department at the Washington Post that entire 33-year period, like George Solomon, who was the sports editor for 28 years, we were absolutely convinced that Washington would support a team and would do well, but you never know until it happens. In September of 2004, baseball decided to find out. Years of political wrangling within the district government and decade-long sales pitches to Major League Baseball finally worked. The Montreal Expos would be moving to Washington. Just a year and a half before, then-Mayor Anthony Williams made the official pitch to Major League Baseball's relocation committee. To use a baseball analogy, I mean, you basically got to hit like a grand slam. I mean, there's no room for you. Know, you're not just trying to get some contact and get on base. Basically, do or die. We were able to convince people over time that Washington, D.C. was uh, regaining its respect, its uh, capability. It was on its way to coming back. And look where we are now in Washington, D.C., where we were able to send the message that we were on the road back. Baseball should be part of that story. In 2005, the story began, and the Washington Nationals played their first season at RFK Stadium. But RFK was a multi-purpose stadium known more for housing the great Redskins teams of the 1980s than baseball's worst team of the 60s. In May of 2006, Washington and baseball broke ground on the future site of Nationals Park just four miles from RFK Stadium along the Anacostia River. I'm not playing in a football stadium anymore, having a place where the fans can go, and it's a baseball stadium. And I think that was huge for, for the organization and the fan base to have. A baseball stadium, not a, not a multi-purpose stadium, but a baseball stadium. You know, most of us thought that that day wasn't, wasn't coming. It would be two years before the Nationals players moved into their new home but they followed its progress. We would drive back from Dulles, coming back to RFK, maybe a Sunday night to pick up our cars, okay? You know, the team's coming back into town. As the buses rolled by the South Capitol Street exit, everybody would turn their heads and strain for a look because you could see the upper deck now. And then on a later road trip, you could see the blue seats actually going into the ballpark. You could tell everybody just couldn't wait to get out of RFK Stadium. Maybe that's when the, uh, I don't know, the attitude or the feel or the complexion of this ball club really started to change because we felt like a family that was building a new house. The Lerner family and all the partners of the Washington Nationals are, be, are proud to be part of your team. Thank you, and let's play baseball. I'll never forget, it was uh, May 3rd, 2006. We were at uh, our offices um, that we have down downtown at Washington Square. And my, my dad got the call. We were all standing in the room with him. And it was, it was pretty emotional. I mean, we were all kind of tearing up. And uh, I, w I wanted that so bad for dad. And uh, uh, it, was, it was just a great move and something I'll never forget. We decided to, to get together as a family and discuss it. And we realized what it would do, both in our privacy and everything else surrounding it, being, becoming a public figures and we got it. We decided it was something we all really wanted to do and if one person had said no, we would have never gone after it. But the, our entire family got together and we said we, we wanted to pursue it and uh, we knew my, the love of baseball my dad had since he was a little boy and I think it was, a, it was an important, it was an important decision for, to make on, for my, my dad and also as a, for us as a family. Eight ownership groups formed in an attempt to buy the Nationals but only one of them was comprised of family members with ties to the district. Ted Lerner, the family patriarch and real estate mogul, is a native Washingtonian who once worked as an usher at the Senator's old Griffith Stadium. But baseball recognized something more in Lerner than his love of baseball and area ties. The Lerner family was much better financed than any other group. And I think that's what baseball was most concerned with. In the years intervening between the Senators leaving town and baseball coming back, there were a number of people who stepped forward and said, well, I'm going to be the owner of a new team. I'm going to pursue a Major League Baseball team. And with few exceptions, most of those people didn't have any money. When they got the, got the team, I think it was kind of a, a collective sigh of, of relief that, you know, okay, we're getting someone here who is 
extremely well financed, who is serious about about winning, and who has a little bit of history here. This was a town whose previous baseball teams were all owned by men who just barely could afford a baseball team. Ted Lerner is one of the richest men ever to own a baseball team. Ted Lerner built his real estate empire from the ground up, and his family would have to do the same with their newest investment. We knew it was going to be tough. We knew we had to get a lot worse before we got better, and that we had to be straight with the fans of what our vision is for the team. To be successful long term and be like the great franchises, like the Cardinals and the Braves and the Yankees and the Red Sox, who even in their worst years are competitive in September. I mean, that's what we wanted to be. We wanted to be there every year, not just once in a while. We knew that it would take us five, seven years to truly get our arms around the whole organization, top to bottom, make changes in personnel that we needed to, and uh, to get, get the organization where we felt we were on the road to excellence every year. The excitement of baseball's return to D.C. was quickly met with the realization that new teams are rarely winning teams. But the Nationals surpassed all expectations throughout the first half of 2005. Sports fans all want instant gratification, now more than in previous decades. And I'm not sure Washington understands how incredibly lucky they were. The first baseball team they had had very little talent somehow stayed in a pennant race all summer, was in first place on the 4th of July, drew 38,000 a game during the summer months, and really showed the team how exciting baseball could be. I don't know what anyone really expected in 05. It was a mixed team of veterans, former Expos, and people, they pretty much had the city at hello. They didn't have to win a game. People were so excited to have baseball, and everyone was walking around wearing Nationals curly W caps and jerseys and, and merchandise and, and what have you. And the team then was really good in that first half of 05. And June went on a 10-game winning streak. And they were leading the National League East by five and a half games at the midway point with a record 19 games over 500. Then they went the other way in the second half of the year and finished 500 and missed a chance of the postseason. And then you had those down years come after that. They averaged 66 wins a season for the next five years and finished at the bottom of the National League East in all but one of those seasons. When the club moved, the farm system was bare. It just, there was nothing in the cupboard. Most of their better prospects had been traded away the, the previous year. So, as a result, you ended up with a lot of guys who were heading towards has-been categories. When they were bad those first few seasons, I heard pe people come back with that same argument, oh, what a mistake. Baseball made a huge mistake putting a team in Washington, as if it's the, it's the city that's playing the games and not the players. The changing faces on the field were matched by the rotating colors in the stands. At home, Nationals fans were often overtaken by visiting crowds. On the road, they were overmatched by better competition. Let me start with Philadelphia. <laughs> I mean, we would go to Philadelphia and the Phillies were in their heyday. I mean, they were so good. Rollins and Utley and Howard and Jason Wirth and Raul Ibanez and all those guys. I mean, they just wore us out. And we felt like a triple-A ball club going into that park. At the Nationals' own triple-A level, the situation wasn't much better. In 2006, the franchise could barely field a team. We had to sign 22 free agents just to fill out the AAA roster, which is unheard of. So it, it, the system was, it was, was dry. There was no quality prospects whatsoever. And baseball just trying to keep a, a good product on the field for the Montreal fans while they owned the team, which made it a tremendous challenge for us. So I, I believe it was a worse situation than starting a, a new organization as an expansion team. It's no fun to lose. Um, whether at this level or, or any level. We kind of knew with sort of starting from the bottom and building up and building the farm system up, uh, you know, we knew we weren't gonna be very competitive for a few years at the big league level, but a lot of us young guys got a chance to, to learn and to get a lot of experience at that level, whereas in another organization, we might not have had that, that experience or that chance. A 67-win season by the Montreal Expos in 2004 left the Nationals with the fourth pick in the 2005 draft. The team selected a third baseman from the University of Virginia. His name was Ryan Zimmerman. I remember Jim Bowden, who was the general manager then, and Bob Boone, who's still uh, very high in baseball operations with the Nationals, coming back from scouting Ryan at the University of Virginia in, t in anticipation of that draft pick in June of 05. And their reaction was, he could win a gold glove and play third base in the big leagues. 
right now. It wasn't long before the Nationals found out they were right. Four months after Zimmerman was drafted, he was a September call-up for the Nationals. In his rookie season, he started all but five games at third base and finished second in the National League Rookie of the Year voting. In his second season, he led the Nationals in home runs and RBIs, and he played in all 162 games for the first and only time in his career. Zimmerman was the first indicator that the Lerner family's vision for success could become a reality. In the spring, he's playing infield for UVA. And in the fall, he's playing infield for the Washington Nationals in the major leagues. The quiet way in which he went about his business, the magical glove at third base, uh, the, the walk-off homers, those were early career indicators to me that Ryan Zimmerman is going to be something special. On other teams, I might not have had a chance to, to do what I did here. Not to be called up at such a young age and just kind of be thrown right into the fire and just go out and you know, trust the 21-year-old kid to play every day is, is not normal for a reason because you know a lot of other organizations first of all have guys that have been in the minor leagues and are developed and are ready to come up and um, so I'm obviously thankful for that opportunity and you know, I kind of just ran with it. On March 30th 2008 Zimmerman played a key role in ushering in a new era of Nationals baseball in Washington. On that day he showed why he would come to be known as the face of the Nationals franchise. I don't think baseball had done this up to that point, but somehow Ted and Mark Lerner talked Bud Selig into bringing the Atlanta Braves in for a one-game series on Sunday night. This was one of those, one of those nights where um, they talk about electricity in the air. There was certainly electricity in the air, and you couldn't have written a, a better script for, for opening night. Guess who? Ryan Zimmerman takes Peter Moylan deep out into the red seats in left center field and I'm up in the press box and I'm, I'm thinking you can't make this stuff up this guy can't keep doing this time after time it's always easier to come up and play and produce when people are rooting for you a lot of people kind of saw my career as I was growing up going to school at Virginia and, and obviously coming here to play everything's kind of been in that area so I have that tie you know, on the other hand too I was a younger guy that they brought up and give a chance and you know, when you're kind of rebuilding as an organization, I feel like it's easier to root for, for a younger guy that you hope is going to be there for a long time. So, you know, like I always say, it was kind of just being in the right spot at the right time. Being in the right place at the right time became an important theme in Washington, not only for Zimmerman, but for the Nationals franchise. In the team's first two seasons in their new stadium, they won just 59 games each year. The Nationals were the worst team in baseball, but it happened just at the right time. Anticipation before first pitch is the loudest I've ever heard. Nationals Park. Uh, Steven walking in for the bullpen after completing his warm-ups to a standing ovation, I think, something he didn't anticipate. To kind of break the moment, pitching coach Steve McCaddy took his cap off and doffed it to the crowd as if all the attention was for him to try and loosen up the moment for Steven. The baseball world waited for this moment for nearly a year. But Washington fans had waited for this moment since baseball's return in 2005, if not longer. I think there was nothing in Washington baseball from 1933 when there was a World Series until the Strasburg first start. And everybody who was a, a, a baseball lifetime writer was in the press box. People who'd covered a million World Series just said, this, this is as good as anything except maybe some of the seventh games of World Series. On June 8th, 2010, all eyes were on the Nationals franchise. Finally, there was a reason to watch the Nationals play baseball. A good reason. Pitcher Steven Strasburg, baseball's number one overall pick in the 2009 draft, was making his major league debut. It was like a World Series game. It was, it was October in June. But if you'd have told me any kid would ever come up to the big leagues and strike out 14 hitters in his major league debut, I would say you are absolutely crazy. Crowds fired up. They're all standing and cheering on every pitch. I've never seen anything like it. They came to.
to see some whiffs. He's walking off the mound, and you know they're counting me down in com to commercial in my headset. And I think the la I didn't even give the score. The, the last thing I said was, "This guy can't be this good." And that's how we went to commercial. And I think uh, maybe those six words are what ring in my mind from that night, because I've never seen anything like it for somebody making their major league debut. Unbelievable. It was just a shot to see him have the poise to do better than anybody thought he could do. And it was just, and it was the first time that I saw Washington, a Washington baseball crowd go nuts. They had been very calm fans, very smart fans, I think, well, considering they hadn't had a team for so long. But that was the night that they stood up and went nuts. Washington baseball fans had plenty to be excited about. And Steven Strasburg was just the beginning. The night before his 14 strikeout debut against the Pittsburgh Pirates, the Nationals, with the top pick in the draft, selected a 17-year-old power-hitting catcher by the name of Bryce Harper. In the span of 24 hours, Nats fans got a glimpse of their instant staff ace and future outfield slugger. With the first selection in the first round of the 2010 first-year player draft, the Washington Nationals select Bryce Harper. When you suffer through those losing seasons, you know you're going to get some number one draft picks. And you got to make the most of them. And, you know, back to back years, you're talking Steven Strasburg and Bryce Harper. And right there, I think this franchise turned the corner. Draft picks started to kind of climb the ladder and, and then come up to this level and, and, you know, produce and help us win. And I think once you kind of start seeing those guys come up, you know, there's more behind them. And uh, you can go out and get some free agents to add to your team. And, so I would say, I guess, just once kind of the guys that we drafted from those two or three years where we, were, we weren't very good and had some high picks, and then once they developed in the minor leagues and finally made it to the big league level, I think that's kind of when the organization started to, started to turn around. Strasburg and Harper were the Nationals' most well-known draft picks, but they weren't the only ones who would make an impact. From 2009 to 2012, the Nationals drafted their future ace, slugger, third baseman, closer, and top minor league prospect. We think we had uh, the, the top four people in the draft for, I think it's four years in a row. That was a, a, incredible luck and incredible vision on Mike's part. Mike Rizzo, the assistant general manager turned president of baseball operations, has been the man in charge since 2009 when the Nationals drafted Steven Strasburg and Bryce Harper in consecutive years. The two players with unprecedented talent required unprecedented spending by the Washington Nationals, in part because of their talent and in part because of their agent. To be able to draft first two years in a row means you've been bad two years in a row, but talents like Steven Strasburg and Bryce Harper only come around once every generation or so. So yeah, timing is everything in life and certainly it's everything in baseball. And as we know now that there is kind of a special relationship between Scott Boris, who's the agent for both of these guys and for several other players in the Nationals, and Mike Rizzo and the learners. And, and where a lot of teams don't want to deal with Scott Boris, the, uh, the Nats' attitude is bring it on. It's my honor to express, you know, the happiness and, and the joy of the Washington Nationals organization with the acquisition of such a fine player. He was, he was a player that uh, uh, our front office and ownership identified early in, in the process as, a, as an impact elite type of free agent that we would like to acquire that would help us not only in the short term but in the long term, not only between the lines but in the clubhouse and in the community. So without further ado, it's my great honor to introduce the newest member of the Washington Nationals family, Jason Wirth. I heard that the team had signed Jason Worth in the press box of a Redskins-Giants game in New York. And I would say that that was more electrifying than many of the other moments that you associate with baseball in Washington. That came out of the blue. Nobody in baseball expected it. I thought I knew what they were thinking about everything. A shock to me, and that's when I said, they're serious. My grandfather played 19 years in the big leagues. Uh, my uncle played a long time. Um, I feel like I'm really young in the game. In December of 2010, 
The Nationals signed 31-year-old outfielder Jason Wirth to a seven-year, $126 million contract. Worth's agent, Scott Boris, was known for getting his clients top dollar in the free agent market. But the Nationals had never before footed the bill like this. Going after a player like Worth and giving him the kind of contract that they gave him put baseball on notice that, hey, I guess the Nats aren't kidding around. It gave him a credibility on the field and in the clubhouse that they did not previously have. Coincidence or not, after Jason Worth showed up, a few things changed with being around the ball club. Uh, the travel changed a little bit, uh, the airline we used, the hotels we stayed in. I don't know if Jason had anything to do that, with that. Urban legend has it that he, do, that he did. Uh, but I do know that when Jason Worth came in, uh, there was a change with the ball club. Well, I think it showed that they were willing to, to spend the money to get a veteran player to come to Washington, D.C. And while a lot of folks may have argued in baseball circles that they overspent to get Jason Worth. They, they spent in dollars and years. They wouldn't be the first team to do it. They're not the last team to do it, but they felt they needed to get an established player into that clubhouse that knew about winning and could have some of that rub off on the younger players that they now had coming up through the ranks. And, and I think it worked. When baseball returned to Washington in 2005, questions arose about the city's ability to sustain a team. Losing seasons through 2011 didn't do much to quiet the critics, who still believed a city that lost a team twice would lose one again. There were people who covered baseball who had been opposed to baseball going back to Washington because they bought into the old, tired, conventional wisdom that, oh, D.C. isn't a baseball town. That, that team can't last. You know, in five years, they'll, they'll be gone, or in 10 years. They should never build a, a park for, for that team because baseball will fail again in Washington. We thought that D.C. could build a stadium and not screw it up, not have huge cost overruns, not build a terrible ballpark, but you don't know. You thought that Washington could provide ownership with enough money and enough brains to, in time, develop a good team, not another team that's last, 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 last for decades at a time. But you don't know. I would say the real pleasure and the relief has come over these 10 years as you realize the town does love baseball. The love can be measured in attendance alone. If you live in the Baltimore, Washington area, pretty much every night between April and October, there's a major league game. In 2005, and certainly in, in last 2014 season, both teams combined drew more than 5 million fans. Well, one team would never draw 5 million fans. So clearly, the Mid-Atlantic region is a great baseball area. It's a baseball town now that, you know, some folks wonder whether it would be, whether there would be enough interest. But consistently, it's there now. You're talking about 2.5 million fans. Uh, I'm sure, you know, as this team progresses, gets better, wins a championship, maybe you'll get close to 3 million uh, of fans a season at Nationals Park. So obviously, there's, there's a fan base, you know, and initially, like a lot of things I've seen over my years in Washington, people would come to games at RFK Stadium or even Nationals Park as transplanted from other cities, wearing the colors, the jerseys of players from the teams that they, you know, their city that they were fans of, that they grew up in. But now you're seeing the, all the kids come to the game and they're wearing the Zimmerman jerseys and the Harper and Strasburg jerseys. They, they've got the marquee names and players that have helped build a fan base among the kids and the Nationals uh, activities in the community with the Youth Baseball Academy and this year big involvement with Little Leagues and all the teams in the D.C. area are wearing uh, Nationals type uniforms for Little League Baseball. So the, the team has really entrenched itself in the community and I think the fans now are entrenched in the Nationals just waiting to see them win it all. Washington's a very transient town. You haven't had baseball in, in a generation. Uh, we had to build a fan base from scratch. I think it's one of the fun things that has happened to watch just the crowd every year get more and more become na real Nationals fans. That includes the politicians who call Washington home. There's a patriotic touch to baseball games at Nationals Park. There's a spectacular view of the Capitol Dome from the upper deck. War veterans are honored each game. And of course, there's the racing presidents. And there's a baseball field to the U.S. Senate. The two Senate leaders, Mitch McConnell of Kentucky and Harry Reid of Nevada, are constantly bickering about legislation. But the Nationals and baseball are common ground in conversations every day.
Senator McCall and I, we disagree on a lot of political issues. In fact, we don't agree on too many. But we're friends, and what do we talk about in our time alone? Mostly baseball. Well, I went to law school back here a long time ago, and I had no money, um, struggled like hell, but I found the money to go to two games, to Griffith Stadium, to watch the Yankees play the Washington Senators. I think um, Major League Baseball in the national capital is so important. I am so happy to have them back, but every so often I think of my uh, trips to Griffith Stadium. From the halls of Congress to the city's youth fields, the Nationals' impact in Washington is evident. Youth baseball is exploding and fields are in high demand. When the Nationals came to town in 2005, the Capitol Hill Little League had 50 kids on four teams. Ten years later, there are 500 kids on 40 different teams. Across the city, the Nationals have purchased jerseys for dozens of youth teams. Just having baseball in the city, that piques everybody's interest. With them winning, now everybody is talking about, about baseball when they probably wouldn't be talking about baseball. But the Nationals franchise has done more than just inspire kids to play baseball. They've created places for them to do it as well. In 2014, the organization opened the Nationals Youth Baseball Academy a state-of-the-art facility that focuses on aftercare, education, and baseball instruction for underprivileged kids in the district. In addition, teams like Gonzaga High School use the facility's fields and help mentor and instruct the academy's kids. Having the opportunity to work with the young youth academy scholar-athlete kids, the third, fourth, and fifth graders, has been just a great experience for our players. Our guys will come over and run a clinic or help out with the Nats coaches uh, for maybe an hour, and then they'll practice after that, or if we have a game later that night, we'll play any games. You know, I think we have the best facility in the area and one of the best high school facility, you know, one of the best facilities a high school program has in the country. Still, despite all the changes the Nationals have brought to Washington, they're still competing with the Redskins championship lore from years ago. The Redskins dominate the town, and they dominate the town's airwaves. And that's unfortunate uh, because most towns that have multiple professional sports have sort of a more sensible division. But the history of the town, the Redskins filled a void when there was no baseball team, when the Wizards and Bullets were bad forever. Um, so you understand why it's that way. But I think the Nationals are going to have to go to a World Series to become a part of the fabric of the town, not just a part of the baseball fans. Fabric. Getting to the playoffs, let alone the World Series, seemed like an unreachable goal during the Nats' early years when they were routinely finishing at the bottom of the National League East. But in 2012, in just their eighth season, the Nationals won their division. Their ascension to baseball's top echelon of teams may have been grueling, but it came quickly. That's nothing. Baseball could have expected, Washington should have expected 10, 15 years. I mean, there are teams that don't win 90 games for 20 or 30 years after they join baseball as an expansion franchise. Out of the 14, ex 14 expansion teams in the history of baseball, at least 10 of them were just disastrously bad for incredibly long times, and Washington escaped that. I think that night where we won the division, uh, obviously a dream, dream come true for all, all, all baseball fans in Washington. Certainly our family, I was, uh, we were thrilled, and it's, not, it's a night that uh, I'll never forget. I've watched the tape many times. Just getting there after kind of being at the bottom of the division every year and kind of slowly working our way up, and um, you know, it's great for the, for the fan base as well. You know, they stuck with us through a lot of those times when it wasn't so fun to come watch Nationals games, and, and now it's, uh, you know, it's one of the things that we do. That's the goal for, for anyone, is to play in the postseason, and, uh, that's the goal every year here now, is to make it to the playoffs, and, and once you get there, anything can happen. The Nationals' first playoff lesson came in Game 4 of the Division Series versus the St. Louis Cardinals in 2012. Down two games to one and facing elimination, the game entered the bottom of the ninth inning tied at one. Jason Wirth, the postseason pro and World Series champion for the Philadelphia Phillies, came to the plate to lead off the inning. After falling into an 0-2 count, he fouled off seven pitches and worked the count full in what would be a 13-pitch at bat. And we keep going like this. Foul ball. 
foul ball. I'm thinking, this is crazy. He will not let this game end. You get through 10, 11 pitches, you've exhausted all of everything you're going to say about the hitter, the pitcher. And I remember recalling with my partner, Dave Jagler, on the radio, thinking in my mind, it was just about a month ago, he had hit a walk-off home run on the 12th pitch of an at-bat against Heath Bell of the Marlins. Remember the at-bat after the rain delay, Dave? I do. Remember what happened? I do. Culminating that at bat? I do. Wouldn't that be nice? I hope you're the summoner. when that ball left his bat that that ball was whether it was going to be in the bullpen or over the bullpen in the seats but I think everybody in the park knew it was gone that game was over Jason knew it as soon as he swung the bat he threw it away and he turned and he looked at his teammates in the dugout as he started to make his move toward first base so I, I, I think everyone knew that ball was gone and we were going to a game five 24 hours later. This is what everybody wanted, FP. They wanted game five. They wanted Gio on the mound. So after an unbelievable thing that happened here last night, here we are. The Nationals' momentum from game four carried into the start of the winner-take-all game five. By the end of the third inning, they had a six-run lead. Three innings later, the Cardinals cut the lead to three. And Nationals manager Davey Johnson went to his bullpen. When closer Drew Storen entered the game in the ninth inning, the Nationals clung to a seven-to-five lead. Suddenly, everything changes. Swing and a line drive right field. That's going to be a base hit. Worth toward the line will pick it up. Of all people, uh, a run of the mill, as they used to say, banjo hitter, Pete Cosma, comes up with the hit that puts the Cardinals over the top. A single to right to drive in two runs, and now lead by the score of nine to seven. The Cardinals scored four runs in the top of the inning, and the Nationals went down in order in the bottom of the ninth. 24 hours after Jason Wirth's home run had saved their season, the Nationals were out of the playoffs. Crazy stuff happens in that ninth inning. We've got somebody like Drew who's got some of the nastiest stuff in the game. You know, to give up some runs, it just it doesn't happen that often. It's the best job when you're good at it, and it's the worst job when, you're, when you fail. So it's, it's part of it. The most disappointing thing, honestly, is I just let these guys down. The Nationals' postseason heartache has continued. In 2013, manager Davey Johnson declared World Series are bust. And it turned out to be a bust as the Nationals finished 10 games behind the Braves and missed the postseason. In 2014, they finished with 96 wins, the most in the National League. They entered the playoffs as the World Series favorites, but lost in four games to the eventual World Series champions, the San Francisco Giants. I think we've learned a lot from the last three years, you know, going to the playoffs in 12 having high expectations in 13 and, and obviously not living up to those. And then last year, having a great regular season and, um, you know, obviously losing in the first round again. Playoffs are kind of a crapshoot. I think the goal is just to get there. But around baseball, the expectation is that the Nationals will win in the postseason once they get there. Despite their late season disappointments, they are fulfilling the Lerner family's goal of staying competitive every year. The Nats now are where the Washington Capitals were in the late 1980s when they got knocked out a couple of times. So the, the Nats will need to fail for about 25 more years before they become a team that has one of those long histories of failing in the postseason. Right now, I mean, I, I hate to tell people in Washington who think that it's the worst thing that ever happened, but many, many teams have this happen to them. Derek Jeter played on Yankee teams that got knocked out in the division series seven times in his career. So get used to it. October's a crapshoot, and two series mean absolutely nothing. Led by an all-star caliber rotation, the Nationals are again World Series favorites. In 10 seasons, the Nationals have morphed into a model franchise within Major League Baseball. They have a new stadium, a deep farm system, and they will host the All-Star Game in 2018. But first things first, the Nationals want to win the 2015 World Series. So how about this for a history-making connection? 
Nationals manager Matt Williams is the grandson of Burt Griffith, an outfielder who had eight at-bats for the 1924 Senators, the last Washington team to be a World Series champion after beating the New York Giants in Game 7 at Griffith Stadium. Who knows? Maybe it's the omen the Nationals need to change the course of history. My absolute pleasure to welcome you officially for the first time, and we love the sound of this, the Washington Nationals Youth Baseball Academy. Please welcome one of the principal owners of the Nationals and our Nationals Dream Ch Foundation Chair, Marla Lerner Tannenbaum. return to D.C. after three and a half decades, there have been a number of unforgettable moments in the history of the Washington Nationals. Who can forget when the city was first awarded the franchise or when the Nationals played their first game at RFK Stadium? Who can forget Ryan Zimmerman's walk-off home run to cap off the first game played in Nationals Park? Or the first postseason games played in the nation's basketball only a few years ago? Well, today marks another milestone in Nationals history. The significance of this milestone will be measured for years to come in a multitude of ways in this neighborhood and beyond. The work that goes on in this building will change lives. I'm here today to thank the donors, the national staff, government officials, and others who've made this facility possible through their efforts. Part of the promise of bringing the national pastime back to the nation's capital was to ensure that all youth in the city would they have the opportunity to benefit from this wonderful game. From day one, the Nationals organization, my father, Ted Lerner, and the entire Lerner, Cohen, and Tannenbaum family have believed in the potential of the Washington Nationals Youth Baseball Academy. It's all about the kids, and uh, you know what, a, what an enormous job it was uh, by Marla and, and her staff to get things to get things looking the way they are today. Uh, it, was, it was a great effort by it, people coming together, you know, the city council, the DC, the, the Nationals, and, and a lot of groups. There's a lot of people responsible for it, but it's all about the kids. Fields are awesome, it, you know. Turf fields. We got uh, we got t uh, two and a half full fields, uh, uh, and most importantly, we've got great classrooms and a great facility, indoor and outdoor, for for kids to spend quality time and to and to really uh, uh, in increase the, the chances of, of them being extremely good citizens. I didn't attend a school as nice as this when I was a kid, so for these kids to have the opportunity to come here to a safe place after school, um, not only the love that they're going to get, but obviously the facilities and the baseball and all the other things on top of that, it's, you know, they're, they're very fortunate. So many have already come together to get us to opening day. Moving forward, it will be the vision, ideas, an action of an entire city that will make the Academy everything it can be for the youth of Washington and, and for the city as a whole. The walls are built. Together, let's make it a home. Thank you.